Good morning, Pastor Brad from Emmanuel. Welcome to our study in Revelation. We are looking at uh, this last book of the Bible. The emphasis clearly is on Jesus Christ, our Savior. I think that's awesome. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment and the culmination of everything that God has promised. It's being fulfilled in Christ. So we're looking at this beautiful book. We're in chapter 2, but let's look, just take a uh, look before we dive right in. Chapter 1, we just finished, and John is writing about things that he has seen. What has he seen? He has seen Jesus Christ. He is resurrected. He is now ascended. Now he is glorified. And so G John is seeing a, a Savior that he ministered with for three years, but now so very differently. He, he bows before him prostrate, prostrate because of his unworthiness before Jesus Christ. When we look at Jesus Christ, we see him exalted. And one day we're going to see this very same Christ as well. It's exciting. I'm just making a simple change, too, in the outline. It, I've had it in, in my head, my heart, my understanding, all that. I just had put it on here wrong, so we're just correcting it this morning. Chapter 1 is this, things that you have seen. Chapter 2 and 3, as we're looking at that, John's now writing about things that are things that are true as he's ministering right here from the Pat island of Patmos, uh, excommunicated because of his testimony for Christ, because of the Word of God. And so now he's writing about the Lord's ministry to the churches. And so with Jesus Christ, he's, he's transforming his church. He's writing to the, to the church, seven churches, and we're going to see that. We're going to be today in chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. We're simply going to see, reinforce, and emphasize the love of Jesus Christ, the need to love Him, and how much Jesus Christ indeed loves us. That's going to come through as we look at this first letter to, to this church. So what we're looking at this first church, is, we're going to see patterns that's going to be picked up in the, in the rest of the seven churches as we go through chapter 2 and chapter 3. So we're going to identify those. We're going to walk through, through those here in relation to this first church and, uh, and see what we have here. The very, first, the very first emphasis that's that's in these seven letters is simply this. The Lord reveals a need to, uh, to a specific church. We have the seven churches here in Asia Minor. And so as John would have written from Patmos right here, then he would have sent the letter to Ephesus. It would have gone this, this route around. This was, a, this was a, a, a major road in the Asian uh, Minor province of Rome. And so the letters would have gone around to these seven churches. And so today we, uh, we see a specific church that he's writing to. That church is Ephesus. It's right here on the harbor. It's the largest city in Asia Minor. In fact, it was the capital of this province. It was under the thumb of Rome. Remember, Rome is, Rome is, in, is the empire that, is, that has the world under its thumb, including Israel, etc. And so Ephesus is this large city. It's, it's progressive. Uh, money is flowing into the city. By the time John writes this letter, it's beginning to show an ebb uh, downward and a trajectory downward. But it's still, it's still drawing people from around the world. We're going to see why that's true. Uh, one of the reasons is the second element here. It, it, uh, within the city is one of the seven wonders of the world. Uh, you can look at that. You can Google that. The seven wonders of the world. One of those was right here. It was the temple of Artemis uh, in Latin uh, called Diana. So it was this temple that was there and it drew people from around the world. We're going to see that uh, as we continue. She was the goddess of fertility, of uh, over sexuality, over childbearing. Uh, that's what they believed. She had the power over, the power to control, the power to influence. And so Ephesus is, is, this is the cultural setting of Ephesus and the surrounding area, is her imprint on the culture. The church is started by Paul in Acts chapter 19. Um, so we see that it's pastored later by Timothy and possibly even here by John. We don't know that for sure, but it's a possibility that he also pastored here as well. Acts, church, Acts chapter 19, we see the church begin here in Ephesus. Uh, Paul's passing through. There are already disciples that are there. Apollo is there. Uh, Priscilla and Aquila are there. In fact, they have a positive influence on Apollo, disciple, and train him. They together work and are, and are having influence. And so Paul begins a ministry there. Um, we see the impact of this early church. Paul, in chapter 19, he enters into the synagogue every week. He preaches the scriptures. He reasons from the scriptures. He, he persuades regarding the kingdom of God. And so for two years plus, actually, he is there. 
and uh, and everyone in, in Asia is hearing about the testimony, Paul's testimony with the gospel. Jews and Greeks, the whole culture is being impacted by this testimony. Now remember, as this is going on, the cultural the cultural imprint on the city is this temple, this temple of Artemis, this temple of Diana. And so Ephesus is the keeper of this temple. Um, so so you have there on the on the left you have a picture of the of, of a portion of that original temple. And on the right, you have a picture of what it might have looked like. It would have been a world wonder, for sure. That's why it's one of the seven wonders of the world. It would have drawn people from all around the world. It would have been impressive beyond words to be able to see it, uh, to have access to it. It would have, it would have drawn people from all over. Um, and so craftsmen made their money. They made statues of the goddess Artemis or Diana. Um, and so much money was made that, that came into Ephesus because of this temple, because of worship of this goddess. And so that, that there's a cultural element here that's significant. And so Paul's preaching the gospel in Ephesus, and it's having impact. In fact, it creates conflict and turmoil. Paul's, as he's preaching, many are being persuaded to turn to Christ. Uh, many people are turning away, and the message is this, that the gods that are made by hands are not real gods at all. There's a danger... Not only that this trade of ours, those who are making money off of this temple, may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing. Their greatest fear here is that they're going to lose money. They're going to lose their livelihood. And, oh, by the way, uh, the temple is going to be falling into disrepute. Ultimately, they're going to lose money because of that, too. So they see, they see what they call the way. They see the gospel uh, impact of this church in Ephesus is having a very detrimental effect. They see they see Christians as as negative. They see Christians as turning the world upside down, and they and they have a view of Christians that is negative and hateful, um, a lot like our culture today. And so so there's a and so there's a riot there, and and um, there is a there is a turning of the people against the church, and yet the church continues to thrive. When Paul leaves that ministry, he leaves a strong church, but he leaves a warning with them in chapter 19. He says, after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you and they won't spare the flock. There's always that danger, so much danger of, uh, of people infiltrating um, the ministry of Christ. And Paul says, that's going to take place here. He says, from among your own people, from among, from among your own self, men will rise and they will speak twisted things and they're going to draw people away to them. Matthew speaks to this, just the danger of those who come in and pretend to be followers of Jesus Christ, pretend to be sheep, but they're wolves. Uh, they're ravenous wolves. They're false prophets. They teach false teaching. He says, ultimately, you will recognize those people by their fruit. Their fruit will not harmonize with the Word of God. In our churches, we have to be so careful. Ephesus here ultimately was so very careful that they, didn't, that they took care of this. They didn't have those in their church that were teaching falsehood. Uh, this, this became a major problem in Ephesus, one that they would have to address. Um, so they would need biblical discernment here. Um, and so what John does is he highlights a specific church. But remember, as he's writing these letters to specific churches, he's writing these letters to be read not only by that church, but those seven churches and, and all the other churches who, would have, who ultimately would receive these letters, the Word of God, and ultimately to us. Um, we see clearly here that the intent wasn't just to a specific church, it was to the church at large. And we are, we are also recipients of, of these letters. The descriptions of these churches describe the churches today that we operate in and are, are marks of churches that exist today. And we are one of these seven churches, our church, your church, whatever that might be. We are called to listen, to hear, to heed. What John does then is give an assessment of each church. The Lord, the Lord puts each church under his discerning eye. And John conveys the Lord's words to each church. There is an assessment that takes place. So as, as John writes here, um, in verse 2, the Lord says, I know your works. I know, I know, I know. What we see here is, is the omnipotence of God. He says, I know, I know your works. First, the first thing that, that the Lord does is he he reveals positive things about this church, very positive things. What an encouragement. There are some real positives going on at this church in Ephesus. 
He says, I know your work. That is the body of work. That is, that is the characteristic of everything that you are doing. That is, that is the mark of your life. That's the mark of everything that's happening at your church. That, that body of work, I know that work. I know what's taking place. Um, we see that in, in verse, verse 2. I know your works. Um, he says in verse 2, you cannot bear with those who are evil. But that's a, that's a positive you know, evil, sin gets into our, into our churches and it, it has, it's a cancer that just spreads. And he's commending the believers here at Ephesus. He commends us. He says to us as believers, individual believers, we're never to tolerate sin in our life. We're to address it right away. We're not to tolerate sin among the body of Christ. We're to address sin because we hate sin. We hate its impact. It is cancer. At the, the believers here at Ephesus were dealing with sin in their church. Not only that, but... He says, you have tested, rejected false teaching, false worldviews against the Scriptures. Look at verse 2. And uh, he says, you have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and you have found them to be false. There are those who have said, well, we're, we are on par with the, with the original apostles, the 11 apostles. Uh, we, 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 carry the, we carry the esteem, we carry the regard, we carry the authority of those apostles. And, and um, John says, no, you don't. And the Lord says, no, you don't. And there were, there were apostles that were called by the Lord specifically. And, uh, and out of that, they're teaching false teaching. They're, they're drawing people after themselves. They're undermining the Word of God. And we must always be careful that we have the filter of the Word of God uh, over our heart so that everything that we receive, everything that we see is filtered by that so that we can, so that we can have discernment and, and be able to discern truth and lies and sort the lies out and reject those lies. And as we're receiving input into our life, think of all the ways you receive values into your life. We need to place the Word of God as the filter over our heart so that we have biblical discernment, so that those, so we don't let values come in that will corrupt us and pull us away from the Lord. The Ephesian believers were doing this well. That's what we are to do as well. That is important. And they hated idolatry and they hated immorality. Look at verse 6. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. We don't know exactly who the Nicolaitans were. They come up in chapter 2 as well. Or later on in this chapter, uh, we see in verse 15 and 16, they're tied, they're tied to, uh, to Balaam in the Old Testament, who, who, uh, who tempted and persuaded and manipulated Israel into idolatry, into sexual impurity. They are, they are um, identified and tied to, to that mindset. So there must be an element of idolatry that there's an emphasis in their teaching, and an element of uh, sexual impurity that's among their teaching. Some would say uh, that, that it goes back to a, a person named Nicholas who comes out of Acts chapter 6 and was one of the uh, uh, original um, deacons that were established. Um, They're in Acts 6. We don't know that for sure. We don't know definitively who this group was, but the impact on the, what little that we do have seems to indicate that idolatry and or sexual impurity was very much a part of their influence and false teaching. And uh, Ephesus is commended because they, they hate what's taking place here. Another positive, I know your toil. I know your work. You are hardworking. You are diligent. You are faithful. Um, he calls us to that. Ministry is hard. Staying faithful to do the work of Christ is hard. It's not easy. The Lord commends them for that. He commends us. He commends you for staying to the course, doing the hard work of, of remaining under adversity, remaining, remaining under trials, and doing the work of the Lord in a way that pleases and honors Him. Not only that, he says, I know your endurance, your patient endurance. You've continued the course. You've not quit. Um, there's a steadiness of heart there. In, in verse 3, uh, you bear up for the sake of Christ. Um, you are bearing up for my name's sake. Adversity, hardship is very much a reality here for these believers because of their identity in Jesus Christ. And they are remaining true. They are remaining true to the course. That is absolutely uh, what's taking place. That is important as well. And in verse 3, they have not grown weary. You know, that only happens because of our relationship with Christ. It only happens because we keep our eyes focused on Christ. We remain um, filled with strength. We remain filled with vitality, with hope, when we keep our eyes focused on Christ. 
the believers here continue to remain faithful and to do the hard work of the ministry. That is so important. Uh, and so Ephesus is, is doctrinally pure. They are, they are faithful to the work of the ministry. Um, and the Lord just commends them for that. What a, what a mark of a healthy church. Uh, there is very much an element that's taking place here in Ephesus that is positive. We see in verse 4, the Lord says, but I also know this, that you have abandoned your first love. We see that here in verse 4. You have abandoned the love that you had at first. Um, in the Greek, your first love, you have abandoned. They haven't lost it. They don't know where it's at. It's not that they don't know where that love is or, or where to go back for that love. It says they've abandoned it. They've made a choice. Uh, they've uh, Whether it's been a, a slow crawl or whether it's been a deliberate choice. Um, they have been moved to a place where they have where they have intentionally stepped away from from being defined by love. They they they're not serving and ministering and operating and doing these wonderful positive things out of a motivation of love for Christ, out of a love for the Lord, for God. They're, they have they have lost um, the ability to love one another biblically. They're they're not doing that in the way that they were, and so love as a mark of the believer is not defining and so when you walk into this church you see a healthy church you see believers who are involved you see believers who are committed to the truth believers who hate sin and yet there's something there's something that's not quite right about that believer there's something that's not quite right about the church and and that is this right here is that what they were doing was they were ultimately doing it for themselves they loved something more than they loved god that's important and so what the Lord is searching for is a depth of connection that goes deeper than, than uh, orthodoxy or doctrine or, or uh, doing the right things or having the right patterns in our life. It's, it's being defined by love. Their love, their passion, their relationship has cooled. It has cooled. There's, there's not the fire that there once was. Apathy somehow has crept in. Um, maybe discouragement. Remember, they, they've not grown weary. They're still doing the, the work of the ministry. But somehow the motivation behind it, which is the most important thing, a love for God and their ministry and a love for people, because ministry is people, their love for people has waned. And an apathy is growing in, come in about God and about people. Um, you know, just a, um, um, a discouragement and, and, and just a, a lukewarmness is coming in, in a sense. Uh, their love for God as, as the priority of their life has been replaced by something else. Maybe it's been replaced by a desire to be known in this church, to have, uh, to have power, to be, to be esteemed, uh, to be seen as spiritual because I'm doing all the right things. Um, whatever it might be, but that love has been replaced and so compromise comes in, corruption comes in, and that's what takes place. We have to remember that Ephesus as a church, when Paul was there, in Ephesians 6, one of their defining qualities was this very attribute. I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love. You love for all the saints. Well, you know what? We can't love the saints biblically unless we love God. When we love God biblically, then we will love biblically. We will love the people in our life biblically. They were defined. The church, when people looked at this church, saw the church, and saw the, and saw the qualities that, that uh, was revealed in the life of this church, it was the love of God. And, and that has waned here. I don't know if lawlessness has crept in. Matthew speaks to that. When lawless, lawlessness increases, our love for God grows cold. Something has come in, and the relationship doesn't have the fire that it did. It's grown cold. And yes, they're serving, but, and, but they're going through the actions. You know what? When you and I go through the actions, we lose power. We lose vitality. Uh, we may be committed to the truth. We may say truthful things. We may be uh, involved in the ministry and, and be faithful to that. But even those things begin to wane in our life when our love for the Lord wanes. And our relationship with people begins to change when our love changes. And that's what's taking place here. Paul reminds us in Philippians 1, his prayer for that church, for his church, for the church of Christ, is that your love and my love would thrive. It would abound and it would bound more and more and more and more. So the Lord assesses the church He's assessing us. Is this us? Is this my life? Is this your life? Is this true of your life? Is this true of my life? Is this true of our church? Um, this is an assessment that our church needs to look at. This is an assessment that every church needs to look at, as we as individuals need to look at. And the Lord puts that church on a designated path. Here's what needs to take place. Every church 
He's, he's putting on a path for success. He's putting on a path to make things right. That's what he's doing. He says to the believers here in Ephesus, remember where you were. Verse 5. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Remember from where you've fallen. Recapture that wonder and identify the cause. Remember from where you have fallen. What's caused you to fall? You need to take some time. You need to spend some time. You know, one of the things when we start, when we start having a, when our relationship with the Lord change, it doesn't have the vitality that it used to. We need to, we need to stop. We need to identify what's causing that. We need to be honest with ourselves. We need to let God have a look into our life. We need to identify what is causing this. What's, what is the factor that's, that's separated me from my Lord? What is separating my love? Why is my love for Him grown cold? And we need to ask God to, cr- to create within us a, a brand new sense of wonder as to who He is. Psalm 42.4, the psalmist says, These things are remembers I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of the Lord, house of God. And he remembers, he remembers that passionate, that energizing, that genuine, that authentic connection with God. And God wants to take you back to that place in your life. If, if your love has waned, if your faithfulness has waned, He wants to take you and I back to that place. Remember, do you remember the love that defined you when you first met me? Do you remember the love that was the quality of your life when you, when you served? Remember those things that were true in your life? When that kind of love was directing your life, go back to that and identify what has caused the problem. He calls us to repent in verse 5. He said that very specifically. Remember and repent. To repent is to change my mind completely. It's, it's to yield my will. I, I do a 180. I change my mind about my life. I look into my life, and the Lord brings me to a place where I change my mind. I change my outlook. My view of myself changes because God gives me a fresh glimpse into my life. And I realize I want to be like the Lord. And so things have to change in my life to be back to that place. And I ask the Lord to bring me back to the place, back to that place, whatever, whatever it is. And that's repentance. It's turning, it's turning away from those things that have pulled me from Christ and, and letting those go and letting God have control again, letting God again be the love of my life and pursuing that. We're going to talk about that. Verse 5, he's very clear about this. He says in verse 5, Repent at the end of that verse. If not, I will come to you. Remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. A lampstand is, is their testimony, it's their witness. We are, to be a, we are to be a light for Christ to a dark world. The Lord says, I will remove your ability to be a light. As a church, as an individual, I will remove your ability to have that privilege, that blessing, that influence for Christ unless you repent. You know, the greatest, the greatest thing we could ever do is reach people for Christ. There's nothing greater. In the church or outside the church, the greatest thing is reaching people for Christ. And the Lord says if we don't repent from this love, He says to the Ephesus here, He will remove our ability to be impactful for the kingdom of God. Someday when we were with the Lord for all eternity, that will be the treasure we hold on to the most, that we have touched lives for Christ. He, you and I were built to want that desire, to want that opportunity, to want that blessing as a believer. The prodigal son, when he was at his lowest and he had, he had replaced his love for his father for money and for inheritance and other things, and he spent all of that and it was all used up, he says, I will rise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And he returned and he was restored. And that leads us to this third element. We are to return. Remember from where you fall and repent and do the works that you did at first. Return to the basics. Return to those basic things that were true in your life when you were thriving, when you were growing. You know what those are. Deep in your heart and deep in my heart, we know what those things are. It is engaging the Lord in prayer faithfully. It is opening His Word and letting it, and letting it pour into our life. It is being with a community of believers. You know, we're never meant to be isolated. We're meant to thrive in the community of believers. Receiving accountability, uh, giving encouragement. We are to thrive within that group. When we get isolated, we're in trouble. Our love begins to wane when we don't have others reinforcing the love of Christ in our life. You know, one of the things COVID has done is, is for, for many believers, it's separated us from one another. We are not in that environment where we're able to thrive 
You need to ask the Lord to put you in that environment. You need to ask the Lord to give you that ability to thrive with the community of Christ, to go back to the Word of God and let it, let it fill you with wonder and awe, to, to, to engage the Lord in prayer again, to be honest and authentic before Him. That's what all this is. Do those things that bring that spiritual transformation of Christ in your life. Return, return. To be fruitful again. The fruit of the Spirit, we're going to see that. Okay? The psalmist says in Psalm 51, Restore to me the joy, the joy of everything that is in Christ, and, and give me, uphold me, a willing spirit. Change my will. Give me a spirit that's willing to do whatever I need to do to thrive with Christ. That's what we're called to do. Timothy puts it this way. Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, fan into flame that gift of God which is in you. Timothy, you need to work. You need to work. You need to work at, at, at fanning that flame of God's work in your life. You need to actively engage. Be actively look at keeping those embers alive, and not just alive, but, but thriving and growing, and, and the flame getting brighter and bigger and stronger. And you and I as believers and as a church, we need, to, we need to fan those flames in one another. We need to actively encourage and exhort one another. Fan that flame of love and passion for the Lord, of walking with the Lord, not just doing the, the good things of ministry and of life like Ephesus is doing, but fanning ultimately the, the love of Jesus Christ, fanning that flame of, an, of, a, of a genuine, wholehearted love for God. That's the first thing. He speaks to the church. He addresses the church. He assesses the church. There's a specific church. The second thing that he does is he encourages us. In each of these letters, these seven letters in these two chapters, he, he reveals the enablement of God in our life. Here we have over and over and over again the ministry of the Holy Spirit in these letters. It's emphasized every time. He is speaking. He is sharing. You look at verse 7, and uh, he enables hearing. I mean, look at verse 7. And this phrase is repeated over and over and over again. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He is speaking. And he is enabling us to hear. Verse 1, verse 3 of chapter 1, we are to read God's Word. We're to read it aloud in the church, specifically, out loud. But we're to read it from our life, read it from our heart. We're to hear it from our heart, and we're to keep it. That's what we're to do. He's called us to hear. Here in 7, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. See, the Spirit is speaking. The Spirit is speaking to your heart all the time. We can quench the Spirit. We can choose to, to not listen. We can plug our ears and not hear anything. The ears of our heart. The Spirit's always talking. We can grow cold to Him or we can choose to listen. We can choose to let the Spirit convict. We can choose to let the Spirit take the soil of our heart and till it up. Make it soft and, and pliable and, and useful so that it can be fruitful. He's speaking all the time and He enables us to hear. Who is, the, who is it that has an ear to hear? It's the one who the Spirit touches. When I receive Jesus Christ, when a person receives Jesus Christ for the first time in their life, by the work of the Spirit of God, they are enabled to hear the voice of God. And that first voice is that call for to salvation, is the call to relationship. As a believer, then the Spirit of God is speaking to us constantly. We hear because we're a child of God. He gives us that ability. The Spirit of God is, is the foundation of these letters. We are called to listen to the Spirit of God. If I'm going to hear the Spirit of God, I must read the words of God because that's what He uses. If I'm going to return to a to a thriving love. I'm going to return to a relationship that's not just doing on the outside good things. And I'm not just doing from my own energy, but I'm doing from the Spirit. I have to listen to the Word of God. So He keeps changing me and conforming me. Then we have the ministry of Jesus Christ Himself. He's front and center. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. He is speaking it, and it is about Him at the same time. Through Jesus Christ, we overcome Verse 7, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, and to the one who conquers, the one who overcomes, I will, that's Jesus speaking again, I will. He is the one through whom we overcome. We see in 1 John 5, the key to overcoming is faith. The one who overcomes is one that believes, that believes that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is God. If you and I believe that He's God, we will honor Him, and we will love Him with all of our hearts. 
He reminds us in John 16 that He won the victory for us. He conquered death. He conquered sin. Take heart, I have overcome the world. I've overcome sin. I've overcome death. I've overcome this world. Because He did, we can. It's not beyond you to be, a, to be a victorious in your life. It's not beyond your grasp. It's not beyond the grasp of God to change your heart, to bring encouragement into your mind, into your emotions, into your soul, and to restore you and bring you back. That's the victory that He, that he brings and He provides. Romans 8, He lovingly, he lovingly enables us in all things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. We can conquer this spiritual battle in our heart, this apathy that creeps in. We can, we can, we can be restored to a refresh, refreshing love for the Lord that can be renewed again in our life. It's, it's conquering and overcoming those things that have become hurdles in my life, that have pulled me away from God, that have drawn the gaze of my heart to someone else or to something else. And it is God who, who overcomes those things and takes my gaze and directs it back to Him. It's important. Through Him we learn to love. Remember in verse 4, we are told, I have this against you. You've abandoned the love that you had at first. The flip side of that is this. He's calling us, he's calling us back to Him. He's calling us to love Him again. And through Christ, we learn how to do that. It's a constant, it's a constant look at Jesus Christ. He is the object of our love, the source of our love. We love because He first loved us. We learn to love because we look at Him. That's the only way we know what biblical love is. How can we love others like Christ if we never look at this? We will love others continually and constantly through our own lens. Our own lens is tainted always by sin. It's corrupted by our own point of view. This is, this is, this is the... The power that cleans and washes our point of view and enables us to see others through love and to see Christ as He loved us. And so he, we understand He is our source of love. He transforms our heart. Above all, keep your love for one another fervent because love covers a multitude of sins. You know what? When we can love others in spite of their sin, we do that because of the grace of God. Every time that... The Spirit of God enables us to love people, period. We are reminded of grace. Because every time we are loved, we are reminded that we have been loved. Every time we love difficult people, it is a miracle. It is the, it is the power of God in our heart. We are called to love difficult people. We are called to love everyone that the Lord brings across our path. And when by the Spirit we yield to that love, we convey that love, we express that love, we are reminded again in that moment of God's grace that He loved us because we were just like that. We were sinners just like that. Through Christ, again, He's our enabler. We, we succeed. We succeed. You know, we go, we look at this, and we see ultimately the attributes of Christ. These are the most significant. Each church is given um, attributes, qualities of Christ that relate to the emphasis to the letter that He's writing to them. He holds us, verse 1 of chapter 2, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, to the pastor, we've talked about that, the messenger, the pastor of this church, write the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand. He's holding these pastors in his hand. He's holding the church ultimately in his hand. He holds us with his own hand. And all of that, he walks among us, verse 2. He walks among the seven golden lampstands, those golden lampstands. It's us, it's the church. Not only these seven churches, it's it's the representative, this number seven, of all the churches in Asia Minor and there in that day, and it's representative of the churches today. He protects us. He holds us. Don't be afraid. I'm with you. Don't be dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you, and I will help you. I will uphold you in my righteous right hand. And he protects us. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one can snatch them out of our hand. He is holding us. And He is our authority when He holds us. What is conveyed is that sense of authority. And He is the head of the body of the church. He strengthens us. Behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. He holds us. He walks among us. His very presence. Through Jesus Christ, we have promise. It is in Christ that we have promise. He gives promise of blessing to every church here. Verse 7 to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life. We have the tree of life. We have eternal life. And not only that, 
which is the paradise of God. To be right with God is to have life. The fruit of being right with God is life. The fruit of righteousness is the tree of life. When you are right with God and when I'm right with God, when we are in relationship with God, we are saved. Then we are promised eternal life in Christ. Psalm 16, You've made known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Paradise is the very presence of God. That conjures up and takes us back to Genesis 2 and 3, uh, 1 and 2, the Garden of Eden. It reminds us of the very presence of God with Adam and Eve. The pleasure, the joy that that was daily until sin came in. That's the very picture that's being conjured up. That's the very picture that will be fulfilled when we are with Christ. We will have eternal life. We will be in the very presence of God. And so what is the call here in this letter? What's the call to us? It's the call to life, but ultimately it's the call to love Him. You've abandoned your love. Return to that love. You shall love the Lord your God. We'll love Him with, with everything, with everything, with, with our whole heart, to surrender, to yield, to give up, to love Him and our neighbor. We have the Spirit of God to help us. We have the Spirit of God to help us. And the Lord says, you know what? I'm coming back. Are you ready? This letter is an encouragement to us to love the Lord passionately, to love Him with our whole heart, uh, to surrender to Him, to yield to Him, to serve, to minister, to not grow weary, to do all those things that, that the church in Ephesus is commended for, but to do it as marked by love. Paul makes it clear that if we serve in the name of Jesus Christ without love, it's, it's nothing before others and it's nothing before God. It's as a gong. It's, it's irritating. It's annoying. But when we do all these things in the name of Christ, but we do it defined by the love of God, it's life-changing. It's transformative. And so my prayer is that that would be true in your life as well. That this morning as we look at this letter to the believers in Ephesus, that the love of Christ would define you and me. Let us, let us repent of our lack of love. Let us turn to the Lord that He might restore our love. Because that love will, will influence everything that we do. And it will influence our ability to love everyone that the Lord places into our life. We will have a testimony that is, that is eternal and lasting because of His love into our life. May that be the case for you and for I this morning. Lord, help us to love with Your love. Help us to be committed to the truth, to the Word of God, uh, to hating evil, to all the things that are commended among this this church here in Ephesus. But above that, may the motivation for which we do all those things be because we love you so dearly. Lord, call us back to that love. Lord, renew within us vitality every day that we might thrive because we love you so much. May that be the testimony of our life, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us. What a beautiful book. What a beautiful challenge. I look forward to, to meeting with you next week. And we'll continue in chapter two. Thanks for coming.